to have uh, uh, Vidya Madhavan here from the University of Illinois. Uh, Vidya is a longtime Boston person. Uh, she was started in like 1993 with Mike Cromie. That's right. Uh, so uh, been in STM ever since. And um, I think I first met you when like Mark Kastner was thinking hiring you as a postdoc for yes, something like this. Uh, but then she went off and said to, to Seamus, because I guess he had an STM. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, and just like, did a, a lot of beautiful work uh, in high to see materials from that. Her career in the last few years has moved into on topological materials. And this is what we'll hear about today. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me. It's really nice to be back. It's, it remains my, Boston remains my favorite city, I think. I, every time I come here, I think I'm coming home. So I don't know. At some point, Urbana will be home. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, anyway, I, I was told this is uh, you know, a friendly audience. So I've taken the liberty of uh, talking about stuff that we are you know, just doing in the lab. Really, it's an unabridged, unedited version of the stuff that we're doing in the lab now. So the first half of the talk, you know, we've been thinking about it for quite a while, so I'm pretty confident. The second half of the talk is literally data that we're just taking. So I don't know. You can tell me what you think of it. Um, uh, today, since this uh, seminar series is apparently about transition metal dichalcosamides, I'm actually going to talk about that instead of talking about all the other stuff, you know, I'm not talking about wild semi metals, I'm not talking about PCIs, so sorry if you were expecting that. I'm actually going to talk about this particular transition metal dichalcosamide, which is titanium dichalcosamide. And, um, okay, so let me plunge right in. So, uh, just to give you a quick overview, you know, you, uh, you, all, you all seen this before. Yeah. Essentially, you know, we're, there's a lot of interesting physics when you have strong spin orbit coupling. There's a lot of interesting physics when you have strong Coulomb interactions. In fact, uh, you can have one without the other and still have uh, very interesting physics. Now, at this end of the spectrum where you have strong Coulomb interactions um, and small spin orbit coupling, we get our favorite high temperature supercomputer. At this end of the spectrum, when both are strong, you can get these interesting heavy fermion systems and uh, from our perspective, what's interesting about the transition metal dichalcosamides is that they actually straddle all of this, okay? So because they're transition metals, they have, you can have strong Coulomb interactions, but, but because of the same reason, uh, they're pretty heavy and you can have strong spin orbit coupling as well. So, and, and not only that, they're tractable to theory. You can actually do, uh, simple calculations, LDA, whatever your favorite theory is, and you can get band structure, and the band structure is not necessarily, you know, uh, it might you might have to renormalize it, but it's not uh, completely crazy to be able to calculate these band structures. So, um, layered dichalcogenides are of this kind, MX2, have been known for many, many decades. And uh, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, you all know about these materials. They have a wide spectrum of physical properties. Uh, crystallographically, there are, there are a few distinct types, but let's just talk about the 2X and the 1P. And the primary, one primary difference between these two is that if you look at the 1P, this layer, right? So this is the M and this is the X2. These are the X2 layers. This layer and this layer, they're identical. So the unit cell, you know, size is smaller, whereas here, this layer is shifted from this one by, by a certain amount. And so the unit, si or unit cell is much la larger in the 2X situation. But you can al already see from here that they're layered and they're due, that means that they can cleave. And in fact, they cleave quite beautifully. They're also amenable to MBE growth, so a lot of people are interested in, uh, you know, extremely thin film monolayer, uh, you know, bilayer versions of these systems. Um, so let me just give you a few different examples of different classes of these materials. Uh, 
So mx2 is what we're interested in. If m were to be molybdenum or tungsten and s were sulfur or selenium, then in that case you get semiconductors. And many people have been interested in these semiconductors for many years. Part of the reason is you can actually tune their band structure by going to thinner and thinner layers. Um, as you go from sulfur to selenium to tellurium, the band gap actually decreases. And in fact, as it turns out, in the limit of having MOT2 or tungsten dichloride, these are actually semi-metals. And more interestingly, they're wild semi-metals, um, which means that they have these 3D Dirac cones. And in the particular case of these two systems, there's something called a type two wild semi-metal where the 3D Dirac cone is actually tilted, uh, tilted on the surfaces that we're interested in. Mo moreover, these things can be made superconducting um, and, uh, and they have interesting properties like very large magneto regions. Um, another class, subclass of uh, dichalcogenides are these where the M now is you know tit titanium, tantalum, and thorium. And now you have a, a, a very interesting class of systems. Uh, these are charge density based systems, and they can be superconducting, uh, it made superconducting with copper, palladium interpolation, with uh, electric fields like uh, uh, you know, gating, and also with pressure. So I'm actually going to be talking about this class of material. And uh, this titanium dichlonide belongs to exactly this class. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about this class of materials. Uh, 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 if you cool down pristine titanium dichlonide below 220 degrees, you'll, it goes into this commensurate two times two times two CDW series, okay? Um, there have been reports, uh, this was you know in 2010s or, or something, STM studies reported a very interesting uh, uh, CDW phase called Cairo CDW, where uh, the CDW was, would, you was seen to rotate as a function of uh, you know, distance along the z-axis. Um, there's X-ray studies have shown that if you uh, pressurize it or add copper to it, then the CDW itself goes from commensurate to an incommensurate CDW, okay? And interestingly, when this happens, you get superconducting effects. So you can already see that the phase diagram of these things is going to be interesting because the emergence of superconductivity somehow seems to be related to this emergence of this incommensurate CDW. Now, X, this incommensuration was studied by X-rays, so people don't know exactly how it becomes incommensurate. There are various ways to get incommensuration. Incommensuration means that the Q vector of the CDW, is, it, it's not exactly a match to the lattice, it's slightly different. So you could get it by the Q vector slightly deviating from this one, or you could get domain voids, right? So people don't exactly know. There's, there are suggestions that maybe it's domain voids that cause the incommensuration, but the interesting thing question is, what is the interplay between these domain walls and superconductivity? Okay, here's a phase diagram. Um, this, if you're familiar with the cuprate, it sort of looks like the cuprate phase diagram. Here, instead of suppressing antiferromagnetism, you're suppressing the charge density wave. Somehow, looking at the phase diagram, it looks as though the charge density wave is a, a competing phase with superconductivity. Uh, this initial study was done in 2006. This was one of the first uh, studies showing that copper interpolated titanium dichlonide is a superconductor. Superconducting PC is quite high. It's 4 Kelvin, okay? And you can look, look at these resistance curves. If you look at them carefully, you see that here's X equals zero, no copper. Uh, the resistance actually goes up and then there's a bump and then it comes down. And people associated, associate this upturn in resistance with the opening of the CDW gap, okay? And you can see that as you add more and more copper, this, the bump position shifts to lower and lower temperatures, 
which is actually what this is showing, right? So they're associating this thing with, CDW, with the onset in, of CDW, and by the time you get to about 6%, this, this uh, poop disappears entirely, and that's the reason you, ha you see no data here. This seems to indicate that the CDW state actually disappears at 6% proper interval. This is the, I'll show you the band structure and you'll see why this is important. This, the, the, this behavior is not completely understood, right? The, this material is on the cusp, the, the Fermi energy is sort of in between the conduction and valence bands and the gap between the valence and conduction bands is not very big. So it's a very, it's almost a metal. It's not a real uh, semiconductor. So. So that's the reason the, 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 uh, the resistance is so complicated. Yes? Oh, I think that's a really good question. What do you do with that? I, I will look into that. That's a very good question. Okay, so that was just copper, but then, like I said, you can make it superconducting with pressure and you can make it uh, superconducting just by, if you have a very thin film and you gate it and you increase the number of charge carriers, you can make it superconducting. And in, in these cases, interestingly, you see that you get this dome-like uh, superconductivity and you have to ask why is there a dome, okay? Okay, for the charge carriers, you might, uh, for introducing copper, you might say that when you go to the overdoped side, the copper actually creates more and more scattering and so, uh, you know, maybe that's why you get a, a depression of the TC, but in, in, in all cases, you get this dome-like superconductivity. Um, okay, so what is our interest in studying these systems? Well, we, uh, there's a big question in these materials about the mechanism of the CDW formation. There are different proposals. Uh, everyone thinks of Fermi surface nesting, and so that was one of the first things people thought about. Uh, but then, uh, you know, for this particular class, uh, one of the favorite uh, mechanisms is excitons. So people think that maybe the, uh, if you look at the band structure, it's such that you have electrons and holes uh, at room temperature, and these electrons and holes can bind, right? And then condense into an excitonic CDW state, and yeah? section of the pattern levels and not interfere too much, but why actually so is the difference in this particular material? That's a really good question. So the, the, I guess the difference between iodine diselenide and this one is of course that there the pristine material shows a coexisting. Here if you look at the phase diagram, there's just, it's just suggestive that there is some interplay, but there is no proof really. It could completely be, a, it could be a coincidence. Right? It's the phase diagram that makes it a little more interesting because as the CDW goes down, and I'll show you more phase diagrams, including the intermesial phase, and then you'll see why people are interested because it seems as though the intermenstruate phase and the superconductivity emerge together. Again, it could be a coincidence, but let's just, we'll, we'll see. So, um, so, and then the chiral CDW phase was actually discovered by STM, so we wanted to see if we could find evidence for, for that. Uh, like I said, we were interested in this interplay between CDW and superconductivity. Are these coexisting phases, competing phases? What happens to the CDW order parameter with doping pressure and seal, you know? So those are the questions we'd like, we were trying to answer. And so here's the titanium diphenide structure again. And what we would expect is we cleave samples, so we would cleave here, so we would end up with a selenium surface, okay? So, yeah, all right. So um, I, I just wanted to show this to you because, you know, what you would expect to see are selenium atoms on the surface. Okay, so this is our STM, and I'm, I'm guessing that you have seen other STM talks before. 
with a scanning primary microscope, you can look at topography. This shows you the positions of uh, the atoms or any other structures. You can look at density of states at any given energy and plot the density of states as a function of position. And from these kinds of DIDV maps, you can get momentum space information um, uh, on the band structure. And you can also park yourself at, at any of these positions and get a plot of the density of states with energy. And here you have a spectrum showing some random superheat activity. So here is a topography of titanium disilini. And if, if you squint, you can see it's composed of bright, bright dark, bright dark. So it's, uh, you can already see the CDW with your eye. Um, it, you know? And so you know, each of these uh, dots here is at twice the selenium. So the distance between these bright dots is two times the selenium percentage. And if you take a Fourier transform, you can see the atomic drag peaks. It's here, here, it's a hexagon, right? And uh, inside that, you see the CDW structure on the Fourier transform, which is also a hexagon. So nothing surprising. This was known by uh, X-ray already. OK, so, so if you take a DIDV spectrum, which measures the density of states, this is what it looks like. Sort of looks semiconducting. And if you zoom in close to the uh, Fermi energy, so here zero is the Fermi energy. Remember, this is plotting density of states. Now, if this, this were a true semiconductor, what you would want to see is a flat zero density of states from one energy to another, and then a rise in the density of states on either side, which would signal the beginning, the bottom of the conduction band and the bottom of the valence band, respectively. But here we see a flat-ish uh, density of states, except there seem to be states in the gap. Okay, and uh, you know I, we've been puzzled by this for a while. But but if you, if, oh, I don't know why I don't have it. But if you, okay, so let me just show you the band structure, and I'll tell you why I was puzzled. So initially, um, the band structure that was proposed for these materials is like this. So here's the Brillouin zone. At the center, which is the gamma point, you have a hole-like band, right? And this hole-like band is made up of the 4p selenium orbit. And um, also, at these L points, you have electron pockets, right? You have six of them. And at this is the Fermi energy. So the relative position of this 4p band and the 3p band is actually in question. Uh, many years ago, people thought that they overlapped in this way. So basically, right at the Fermi energy, you have a few electrons here and a few holes here. And this made people think of both nesting and the possibility of forming exoplanets. But most recently, the band structure that people now think is correct is the following. So here's ARPES data. Here's this. Um, a whole like band that I was telling you about, but notice it's about 50 millivolts from the Fermi energy, even at room temperature. And here's right here at the L point is this electron band, and that's you know sh just 12, 12 millivolts, 50 below the Fermi energy. So even at room temperature, you have a tiny little gap in this system. Okay, and what happens when you go into the CDW phase is that this gap gets bigger by a substantial amount. Uh, it gets bigger by, it goes to about 80 millivolts or even 100 millivolts when you go into the CDW phase, okay? So that's a huge gap for a CDW system. Um, in, interestingly, from ARPES, the reason they know that you have a well-established superstructure is that you have band folding due to the superstructure. Now you see this gamma band also at the L point due to band folding, okay? So you see this gamma band very clearly at the L point below the CDW point. In any case, from our best, it seems like we're doing all this at 6 Kelvin, so it seems like it should be an insulator, a very clean insulator, in fact, right, with a, with a, with a zero gap. So the fact that we're seeing states in the gap, I think it may be because we have impurities. We have a lot of impurities in the system. You can also, uh, you can also question how, does the, how do these impurities 
uh, affect the CDW? I'll get to that. You know, do they create domain walls, for example? I'll get to that in a few minutes. It looks pretty much the same. Yeah, now if you park yourself right on top of an impurities, you'll see in gap state. But anywhere far from impurities, it looks exactly the same. Yeah, there's not, it's not inherently different. The first order. So let me just answer a few questions. Uh, let's talk about the chiral CDW state. The chi supposed chiral CDW state, I'm gonna go through this pretty fast because I'll just tell you the answer right now. There's no chiral CDW in this system. And there was a lot of excitement for many, many years about a possible chiral CDW. And I'll just show you why I don't think there is one. So the chiral state is where people thought that maybe the CDW Q vector occurred in three different, you know, you have many layers. So on the top layer, you had a Q vector in this direction. In the second layer, you had a Q vector in this direction. And the third layer, you had a Q vector in the third direction the Q vector would rotate as a function of layer, okay? That was the chiral CDW. Now, if you have rotation, you can imagine the rotation going this way and the rotation going in the opposite way. So you have two chiralities. And what people were interested in is the possibility of having domain walls between these two chiral uh, CDW states, and maybe they would be domain walls. So, but, but let me just show you what we see. So this is our topography, and, uh, you know, you get these, uh, these dots which represent the CDW state in the Fourier transform. Um, first we tried to take topographies at different bias voltages and then we realized, well, all the topography gives you is a convolution of the atomic positions and what the charge is doing. So in order to really figure out what the charge is doing, instead of taking topography, what you have to look, is a, look at is a DIDV map. A DIDV map allows you to isolate the atoms from the charge, okay? So this is a DIDV map. It's just a measure of the local density of states at this energy, 100 millivolts above the Fermi energy. And what you see here in this map is you see these flower-like patterns, okay? So, so here's a flower here, another fl hexagonal flower-like pattern. And now we can try to ask where are the atoms so here, all these red circles, each red circle is a selenium atom. And if you look carefully, you realize, let's look in this direction. Here's a red circle, it's bright. Red circle, dark, bright, dark. That's your typical CDW, no problem. But in addition, you also, so you see that in all three directions, okay? So already you have evidence because you see the charge in all three directions, you already have evidence that there is no chiral CDW phase here, okay? In addition, you see other dots which occur in between the atoms, okay? So what are those other dots? Well, as it turns out, we are imaging the selenium, uh, the CDW in two layers, the top selenium layer and the bottom selenium layer. And so the dots that we see correspond to this this, 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 and this, and hence the flower. So we can see both layers, and in both layers, it's a uniform two by two CDW with no chiral vector. Okay. There should be, and we don't see the titanium uh, CDW very well. Part of the reason might be that those, those are associated with D orbitals, and usually in SPM, we have trouble seeing the D orbitals. So. Okay, so now let's talk about what happens to the CDW when you interpolate copper. You, we know from X-ray that you should have incommensuration. So the question now is, do you have domain walls? Okay, so, so here's what the image looks like with copper. I have to tell you, these, these copper <laughs> atoms and clusters, you have to sort of treat them really gently. Remember, it's intercalation, so they're actually in between the layers. So when you cleave, if you were to cleave at room temperature, they would all run away. They would either run away to the step edges or they would evaporate. So in order to see these copper atoms, you have to cleave at low temperatures. Okay, so, so now what do we expect? Well, we are trying to see what happens when this is suppressed. Um, you know, from our pairs, the band folding disappears around 6%, <coughs> and we are at 8%. So it's 
certainly seems to uh, indicate that maybe there is no CDW. Uh, however, like I said, X-ray studies reveal an incommensurate peak right above where superconductivity occurs. Okay, so this is recent data from Peter Abmonte's group. And you see this is really interesting and striking. These two are coincidental. That's what I want to show you. Okay, so now let's look at the topography. And if you, if you immediately <coughs> see that there is actually a CDW. This is at 6 Kelvin above PC. Uh, you can see the CDW with your eye. Uh, you, you know, if you look carefully, if you squint, you see bright, dark, bright, dark. You can see the bright, dark patterns. There is a CDW in the system, even with 8% copper interpolation. Okay, that's very clear. Now you take a Fourier transform and you see those uh, super lattice peaks again from the CDW, but you would immediately notice that these are actually split up, right? Instead of one peak, you get two, right? And the cra so let me just show you the pristine uh, sample again. So these are your CDW peaks, and here you have each one pixel bright peak. And the question is, what is this due to? What is the splitting due to in this uh, copper interpolated sample? And so to answer that question, I'm going to do something which, you know, you might think of as trickery, but I'll show you that it's not. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take an inverse Fourier transform of only the CDW peak. All right? So this is the pristine sample, and this is an inverse Fourier transform of only these peaks. So basically, I'm picking out only these periodicities. And you can see that it's a beautiful, at least on this length scale, uh, it looks perfectly homogeneous, and we have data over thousands of angstroms, and for the pristine sample, if you want, I can show you later, over large length scales, the CDW looks really homogeneous. Now, if I were to take the inverse Fourier transform of these peaks, you begin to see inhomogeneity. In fact, it's a very peculiar kind of inhomogeneity. You see all these lines. Here's a line, a line, a line, right? And they're sort of domain wall-ish lines. Okay, so, so here's a comparison between the two. This is copper interpolated, this is not. And the question is, how do I prove that the splitting of the peaks and the inverse Fourier transform is actually re related to creation of domain walls? And so uh, let me just show you this. This is just one of those crazy things. It happens in STM sometimes. As it turns out, this material is very, very susceptible to having high voltages applied to it. You can actually create and destroy domain walls with the STM chip if you scan for large periods of time at high voltages. So here is a portion of the sample with no domain walls. The CDW looks nice. You have these sharp peaks. And this is the inverse Fourier transform. And you can see the CDW quite clearly. It's perfectly homogeneous. Here's the same area after having us having scanned and sort of created these domain walls, and you can't really see them right now, and I'll show you in a second that these are indeed domain walls. Now the peaks have split up, and you take the inverse Fourier transform, you see these lines. Okay, yeah? This is, uh, exactly, you scanned at 400 megahertz. So what we do, so what we do is we, t because, because we realized this pretty early on that we could actually disturb the surface. So whenever we scan, we scan at low bias and low current. Yeah. And then in order to create these domain walls, we purposely scan over and over again at high bias and high current. So you have to do it many, many times. Yeah, I just want to confirm. Would yeah. you regard it as a high bias? You said 400 millivolts. 400 millivolts. <coughs> but continuously scanning yeah. at 400 millivolts. If you just scan once, you won't see it. It doesn't create domain walls. Yeah. What, what does the cutoff mean? Is the, the clear state of the information? So the sorry, sorry? Cutoff and. Uh, oh, the cop radius. Yeah. They move. Everything changes in the system. If you're, if you're not careful and you scan at high, uh, large currents, the copper atoms go away. In fact, we use that to get QPI. 
Because the copper atoms are so mobile that in their presence, you can't get QPI information. So we deliberately clean large areas and then get QPI. Yeah. So this actually is copper interpolated titanium diselenide. So we don't create these, we create these into copper interpolated samples. And this area has been cleaned of copper simply by sweeping the copper away. And it's, the copper is all away it's gone. It. Yeah, it's gone. You can pulse the tip and create large area, large cleaning area. Copper is very, and in fact, it makes sense. The interpolated copper really is not chemically bonded to the surface very well. Okay, so, so now you, so, so then you get these lines and here you can see with your eye actually. So if you were to track the CDW across this line, this red line, you can see you start off in a, you know, this line starts bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, and you end up in between the CDW. So you can see that each of these lines I've drawn here, which represents these things, represents a phase shift in the CDW. So what I'm trying to tell you is, in this copper interpolated sample, we have domain walls. And each domain wall is a pi phase shift. So here you have a pi shift phase shift between this and this. And you can see that when you take a Fourier transform as a splitting of the peak. And in fact, the distance between the peaks gives you an approximate size of the average domain size. Okay, that's what that distance represents. And so, um, this is another, you know, this is just, this is another domain and here's a line cut. You can see the CDW up, down, up, down, up, down, and you can see it disappearing right here. So just to show you that you have domain walls in the system. But as it turns out, the Q vector is identical. Uh, if you just were to go and take a selective Fourier transform of only this region, where there's only one domain, you would see one dot at the Q vector of the CDW. But then you put them all together and you take a Fourier transform of this image. Now you have to make sure you, you know, when you take the inverse Fourier transform, you have to keep the phase information. You can't forget about that. But because of the finite size of these domains, the peaks actually split. You can do a very simple simulation, try it for a chain of atoms and have a pi phase shift and you'll immediately see it in your Fourier transform. Yeah. That I, I feel like, I haven't tried that, but the, in this case it's a pi phase shift. Okay. All right, so now the domain size that we have is about 100 angstroms, 10 nanometers. Okay. So now, now we've established that incommensuration in these materials proceeds to the formation of domain walls, okay? Which is quite interesting. So you might, you know, there, are, there have been proposals that say that, see, uh, that superconductivity is seeded at these domain walls because in this particular case of a two by two by two CDW, the CDW order parameter actually goes to zero at the domain wall boundary, at these boundaries. Since the order parameter goes to zero, if the CDW is a competing phase, then you would expect superconductivity to actually germinate at these domain walls, okay? There might be other reasons that the CD superconductivity might want to germinate here. So, uh, so this ha seeing these domain walls is interesting. So what about the CDW mechanism? Well, so one of the, there were many different proposed mechanisms for the CDW, one of the earliest ones was that you have the formation of this exciton, but remember to have these excitons, you need some kind of either an overlap, which gives you a sort of a negative gap, or a very tiny gap between this gamma band and this um, 3D band at the L point. If you have a gigantic gap, then the exciton binding energy has to be very, very large. Only then can you have you know, a bound state. So, so we wanted to check the band structure and to do that, and this is another possible mechanism, which is that you have phonons freezing at low temperatures and through electron phonon coupling, you can get a CDW. So there are many different mechanisms proposed. So one of the ways to answer these questions is to look at the band structure. And we do that by um, using QPI. And I'll quickly go through this because I want to show you what happens below TC. 
So here's uh, an area of the copper intercalated sample where we've, we've removed most of the copper atoms with the STM tips. And now we're going to look at QPI. Quasiparticle interference is a very simple uh, technique. You have incoming electron waves, and you have some kind of a scattering center. And when the scattered waves interfere with the incoming waves, you have here, uh, you have an interference pattern. And we can see this interference pattern with the STM, and we also can get the modulation of this interference pattern, that is the wavelength, by doing a Fourier transform. And we know the wavelength from these interference patterns, and we know the energy because we're controlling the energy with the bias voltage. And because you know the mo wavelength and the energy, you can get dispersion. Um, so, so just an, ex it's an example of what we do. We take uh, the IDV maps, right? And here's a here are three scattering centers, and you see these rings. These are the electron waves in a simple isotropic system. Uh, so these, these scatterings uh, represent scatterings uh, on the constant energy contours. Electrons can go from here to here, here to here, here to here, anywhere along the constant energy contour. And in Q space, we should, these, these circles should represent a circle whose radius is twice of K. Now, if we were to do this, these R space maps as a function of energy, you would see Q space maps with ever increasing circles. And if you were to plot this Q vector, you would get dispersion. That's what we do in STM. We take these R space maps as a function of energy, take the Fourier transform to get all the Q space vectors, and then plot that as a function of energy. OK, so here's what we see for this uh, titanium diselenide. Here's the map below the Fermi energy, and here's a map above the Fermi energy. You can already see they look very, very different. And now, let's see what do we expect. Well, below the Fermi energy, you have a hole-like band at the gamma point. So it should look like circles. So if you go from below the Fermi energy and go up towards the Fermi energy, the size of these circles should get smaller and smaller. Above the Fermi energy, you have these 3D bands at the L point. So you have scattering in between these bands, right? So you should get all kinds of Q vectors. And the topology of the Fermi surface should get reflected in the Fourier transforms. So let's see if that's true. In fact, look, here are the Fourier transforms. And in fact, I'm going to show you a movie. I'm going to start from below the Fermi energy. So you'll see circles that get smaller and smaller. And then once you cross the Fermi energy, suddenly the symmetry of the whole thing will change and you'll get the six-fold structure. So you get see, see this shrinking circle, and here now we've crossed the Fermi energy, and now you get this six-fold symmetric structure, which, which represents the D-band. So, you know, shrinking circle. Uh, yeah, you get the six-fold symmetric structure, and you're seeing the D-bands now. So yeah, we can see the bands with STM, and we can get the dispersion. And from that, we see that the 4P bands are, uh, you know, the top of the 4P band is just above about 180 millivolts below the Fermi energy. The bottom of the D band is below the Fermi energy, interestingly, right? But not much below, okay? So a couple of things here. First, there's a gap. There's a distinct gap. Second, Copper intercalation places the Fermi energy into this D band, right? And one interesting thing here is if you look at where this Fermi energy is with respect to this band, it's actually close to the bottom of the band. So you don't have that many carriers. And yet you get superconductivity. So this is quite interesting. OK. Yeah, this is sorry. Uh, sorry about that. That's me. Yeah, that, yeah, it's my yeah, yeah, thank you. Very good. It should be any. So now let's ask what is the effect of the domain walls on the electronic structure, and then I'll get to superconductivity. So here's the same uh, I inverse Fourier transform again. And if you take a line cut and you plot the DIDV, here's what you see. you see. You see something really interesting. What you see is here is the spectrum away from the domain wall, and here's the spectrum, these are spectra on the domain walls. 
there's an enhancement of the density of states right at the domain wall, okay? Now, remember what a domain wall is. A domain wall is, is a topological defect. It's not like having an impurity or having the atoms actually being rearranged. This is just the charge that's getting rearranged at the domain walls. It shift, there's this high phase shift that falls. Just that has a huge dramatic effect on the density of states, okay? So you have an extra population of fermions at the domain walls in these systems. You know, what these fermions are doing is a quest another question altogether. 